If you know anything about the history of R.A. Fisher, you know that genetics and statistics have had this intimate relationship for many, many years. I think at this point, though, in the evolution of the two disciplines, the information flow is profitably from big data mining into genetics. Now, that doesn't mean that genetics problems don't influence the nature of data mining and statistics, but I don't think we can afford to overlook the opportunities for bringing big data algorithms into genetics, and that's what I want to focus on today. A generation ago or more, there was this controversy between Bayesian and frequentist statistics. In my opinion, that was largely resolved in the favor of Bayesians. Bayesian analysis gives you more nuanced understanding of any statistical situation. However, the dominance of Bayesian ideas over frequentist ideas is flipped in the last generation because Bayesian methods are much more computationally intensive. And a lot of big data analysis is driven by frequentist methods and in particular optimization because MCMC is just too slow. So what we're seeing nowadays are these very high dimensional optimization problems and there are a few key ideas which drive this field. One is penalization, which is a way of achieving parsimony. Uh, and I'll show you that penalization, there's an alternative, which I'll call set projection, which amounts to, reaches the same end goal, namely sparsity. I'll talk a little bit about parallelization of uh, algorithms, how that makes, plays into big uh, computing uh, frameworks. And I want to talk about various algorithms. Uh, most of you, I hope, have seen EM algorithms. And I want to talk a little bit about a generalization of EM algorithms, which I call MM algorithms. So I'm going to do this through a, a list of examples. And because this is a mixed audience, I will try to bring as many of you along as possible. So I'm going to review some basic mathematics. If you get bored, just kind of take in a little slumber. And we'll return to the main current as we go along. I certainly don't have time to prove a lot of assertions. But if I can give you some idea of the mathematics behind some of these algorithms, I think I'll have achieved one of my goals as an educator to demystify mathematics. OK, so the first example is ancestry estimation. Uh, people are interested in their ancestry for various historical uh, reasons. Also, ancestry becomes an issue in correcting for uh, confounding in genetic association studies. So I got interested in this area a few years ago because the existing software structure, it used a Bayesian MCMC method for estimating ancestry. And it was taking a month of computing time, just on a single uh, desktop computer, to do many of the calculations. And this, in retrospect, seemed unacceptable to me. Uh, if you do computing, practical computing, you want an answer in most a few hours. You need a much faster turnaround time. Uh, there were some alternatives. Uh, one is Eigenstrat, which uses principal components. This is, uh, of course, much faster because principal components are well understood in statistics. They don't deliver exactly the same thing as structure, which delivers ancestry fractions. And for that reason, it's still useful to have alternatives to principal components. The Frappe program coming out of Neil Risch's group uh, used an EM algorithm. Uh, and that also, uh, although I like the model, turned out to be much too slow. So the existing software was too slow in my opinion. And the only alternative did not deliver the uh, desired admixture fraction. So I set out with a graduate student, David Alexander, and we wrote a program called Admixture, which turns out to be much faster than the competition. So let's try to explain this. So you have 
a certain number of populations, and you have a certain, you have two alleles. So this is for SNP data. And there are two kinds of parameters you're trying to estimate. One is the fractional contribution uh, WIK of individuals' eyes genome that's coming from uh, population K. And the other is the, you may need to estimate the frequency of the SNP, the reference allele SNP in each population. And those are the FKJs. So in unsupervised mode, you're, you're trying to estimate both of these sets of parameters. If you know the ancestral populations, presumably you also know the uh, SNP allele frequencies, then you would only estimate the uh, admixture matrix W. So the model is quite simple. It's summarized by the equation on the bottom of the screen. It makes the reasonable assumption of random uni union of gametes, but it also assumes, unfortunately, linkage uh, equilibrium. Now, since ancestry informative markers are relatively infrequent, uh, we, don't, we only use a small subset of the markers. So this is not as onerous an uh, assumption as it sounds like. So the unknowns of the observed here are these numbers yij. There are numbers between 0, 1, and 2. they are numbers of reference alleles. And if you write down the simple-minded log likelihood for the data, it's a binomial log likelihood. And here set the observations. So these numbers are between zero, uh, 0 and 2. This is the frequency of a given SNP for a given person. And you want to estimate the Ws and the Fs. Okay, so if you have at all large sample size, say you have a, a thousand uh, individuals, you might have uh, 10,000 SNPs, maybe three populations, you're already up to 33,000 parameters to estimate. That's a large number. And you need to do this quickly. So if you turn to traditional tools of numerical analysis for solving these problems, one of them is Newton's method. The other one is Fisher's scoring. Uh, these actually don't work very well because they require calculating these large matrices which give the curvature of the log likelihood with respect to the various parameters. And then you have to invert these matrices. And the matrix inversion problem becomes uh, limiting in the whole analysis. Also, there are constraints in the problem. The allele frequency is at the reference allele between 0 and 1. The admixture fractions are non-negative, and they sum to 1. There's some symmetry, because the, you can permute the different populations and get equivalent optimal points. So there are complications here that uh, made it difficult to handle this problem. So how did we attack it? We attacked it by what's called block ascent. And block ascent means you separate the parameters into two sets. And you update one set of parameters, holding the other fixed. And then you hold the other one fixed and update the, the, the second set of parameters. So that's what we did. And this works actually very well in this problem. Uh, you have a condition called concavity, which makes it the solutions, these block ascent solutions, unique. And when you do the updates of the admixture coefficients, the Ws, those, per, those problems split into separate problems for each individual. So if you have a high dimensional optimization problem you want to solve, the best way to solve it is if you can kind of separate parameters and work on much lower dimensional problems. So this allows you to work on the low dimensional problems connected with each individual. And uh, in the update of the frequency estimates, you can work on each SNP separately. So you've simplified by going to block ascent, you simplified problems which break into subproblems. Okay. These are solved by 
approximating the log likelihood by a quadratic function that incorporates slope and curvature. This is what Newton's method is all about. I won't go into details. It's called sequential pro quadratic programming, and it actually works very well. And you can take this basic algorithm, and there's generic acceleration methods that you can use to make it even faster. Finally, you can calculate the standard errors. And this is not often done in these ethnic admixture studies. If you go to a company like 23andMe, they'll tell you your frequency, your admixture coefficients across various populations. They won't tell you the noise involved in those estimates, how much air there should be. Uh, and this is an important clue. But you can calculate standard errors either by a bootstrap or uh, if you know the frequency matrix uh, by standard methods. So this program is the single, the, the uh, citations for this program are the single biggest contributor to my own citation counts on Google. It's really caught on and we've kept improving it. Uh, so now you can estimate the number of underlying populations using cross-validation. You can exploit individuals of known ancestry. Uh, you can fix the allele frequencies in the, each of these ancestral populations. You can even in, encourage admixture parsimony. So you, instead of getting someone who's 0.001% African, that's probably not likely. You can make the estimation procedure, push those estimates to zero. You can use parallel processing, and now we can use X chromosome and sex-specific uh, admixture analysis. So that's, that's gone pretty well. Now, I'm going to talk about another example. But before I do, I want to just bring some of you up to speed on a little mathematics. And this is not high school mathematics, but it's not graduate school mathematics either. So, in n-dimensional space is what we'll be looking at instead of two-dimensional, three-dimensional. You can define these things called inner products. And basically, an inner product of two vectors, you take the coordinates of the two vectors, you multiply them point-wise, and then you add the sum. That gives you what's called an inner product. And that defines a notion called perpendicularity. Two vectors are perpendicular, and this accords with geometric sense if this inner product is equal. OK, in n-dimensional space, you can also define something like a distance. This is called a Euclidean norm after Mr. Euclid. And it's basically defined by taking a sum of squares and then taking the square root, just as you would in two or three dimensions. OK, and that, that gives you the distance of a vector from the or origin. This is just high school geometry turned into algebra. Now, I will be talking about uh, singular value decompositions, and this is where I'm actually headed. And there, instead of an inner product, there's something called an outer product. So an inner product, you have the two vectors like this. That one multiplies that one. You get a scalar number. In an outer product, you have two vectors multiplied like that. And instead of a scalar, you get a matrix. Okay. So here's an inner product. Here's the norm of a vector. These are the two vectors we're talking about, u and v. And this is the outer product. So the outer product is, again, you're taking the pointwise product of coordinates, but now you're displaying all of them in a little matrix. And this turns out to be the essence of what's called the singular value decomposition. And this is a big deal in certain parts of genetics. OK, so what's the singular value decomposition? Again, this is standard material, but some of you may not have seen it. The singular value decomposition, you're representing a matrix as a scaled sum of outer products. So the sigma i's are called singular values. They are scalars. The Oops, I missed uh, uh, subscripts on U and V up there. So it should be a UI VI transpode. 
So you have a linear uh, combination of outer products, and the number of terms in this sum is called the rank of the matrix. Okay, so rank has something to do with parsimony, and that's one of the things we're going to talk about in just a moment. Okay, so we have singular values, they're non-negative numbers. We have singular vectors, which are among themselves, the, the left singular vectors are orthogonal, the right singular vectors are also orthogonal, and they're arranged all so that they're unit vectors, they're vectors of length one. Now, it takes a lot of understanding of algebra and numerical analysis to extract these singular value decompositions, but in any good programming language such as MATLAB or R that statisticians routinely use, this is done behind the scenes very quickly. You would be silly to try to write this software yourself because you could not improve unless you were totally expert on how this is done. So think of this as a black box. If I give you a matrix M, you can extract a singular value decomposition and you can approximate this singular value decomposition by changing the rank. So if you don't include all of the terms, you have a, an approximate singular value decomposition that may be pretty close to the original matrix. Okay, so where did we use this? So a few years ago, and this is all recent mathematics, uh, a friend of mine named Emmanuel Candies, he's at Stanford, thought of a way of solving a problem that he called matrix completion. Now what is matrix completion? The simplest example I can give you is the Netflix problem. The Netflix problem had a million dollar prize on it. And Netflix wanted a recommender system. So what did they have? They had a matrix of values and on the rows of the matrix were individual movie watchers. The column of the matrix were movies. The entries of the matrix, matrix were uh, numbers between one and five, their rating of a movie. Now you can imagine this matrix was very sparse because most people don't watch all 20,000 movies. Okay, so they might might rate 20 movies, who knows? So they had a matrix completion problem from this perspective. They wanted to fill in the missing ratings in this huge matrix with great sparsity. Okay, so how does one do this? You're given an observed M, M by N matrix X and you've got some entries indexed by this Greek omega that are observed and you want to fill in the missing entries. Well, in fitting data, least squares is what you typically do. So here you have a least squares problem. You want to match the existing, the filled in entries as well as you can. But, and here's where parsimony comes in, you want the rank of the approximating matrix to be well controlled. So you want a low rank matrix which will fill in the missing entries and give you your prediction of what the person likes for their next movie. Candy's won the, the uh, Waterman Prize from the National Science Foundation. They, one year they give out one prize to some of the most innovative work. Okay, now they attack the problem by taking, adding a penalty. So the penalty is uh, the second line from the top, it's lambda times the, what's called the nuclear norm of Z. So Z is the approximating matrix. F was that sum of squares. And this nuclear norm basically takes for the underlying matri matrix and sums its singular values in its singular value decomposition. Okay, now if you want an algorithm which will minimize that function, this is ripe for techniques from 
traditional statistics like the EM algorithm, you want to kind of temporarily fill in the missing data and then iterate. So you fill in the missing entries by your current guess. So you have a matrix ZN, and that gives you a ZN IJ for a missing entry. And you use that as, you add that to the overlying uh, objective function. And now, by doing that, you complete the sum of squares, which was over only the missing entries, so that it, in fact, is over all of the entries of the matrix. So you add terms, which when zij is equal to zinj, they amount to zero. OK. So then, once you've filled in the missing entries, you, you, can re, you reduce the problem to a problem with a known solution. And the known solution says, oh, we can now construct z by taking the singular value decomposition of this matrix xn with its observed entries and its filled in missing entries. And we shrink the singular values. This is a shrinkage operator. We don't let the singular values go below 0. They're supposed to be non-negative. But all the singular values get shrunken by subtracting this penalty constant. And that sends a lot of the singular values to 0 and forces a lower rank solution. OK. So once you've shrunk the singular values, then you have fewer singular uh, fewer outer products to combine. You just take the existing left and right singular vectors and reconstruct your approximation. And that algorithm drives the objective function downhill. So you have an, you're trying to minimize something. So how do you minimize it? You keep driving it downhill. And that, uh, you can accelerate this. There are complicated ways of doing it. You can phrase it in uh, language that's common in the, the big data field. But this turns out to actually work quite well. OK, so this is where genomics comes into play. Where do we have data matrices with missing entries? Any GWAS study will generate, typically, a data matrix, individuals along rows, SNPs along columns. If you have typing on different platforms, you're going to actually have a, quite a bit of systematic missingness. And so we take these, and, and you can have missingness because some of the reactions aren't callable. So you have systematic and you have kind of random missingness. So what we do is, if we want to impute missing genotypes, we look at the genome kind of block by block, window by window, and we slide these windows along the genome. So there may be 300 SNPs in a block. And we need to figure out how much penalization goes on, because in the singular value, the matrix completion problem, there was a penalization con constant. So we mass some of the entries in the left and the rightmost block. And we train on the, on the observed entries from all three blocks. And then we choose the penalty constant based on the holdout set. So we systematically held out some observed entries from A and C. And w once we've done that, we've chosen how much penalization we're going to do. Then we impute the missing entries into this middle third. And that turns out to be a highly accurate way of imputing missing genotypes. Now, what's very odd about this is there's no genetics in it at all. What is it exploiting, though? It's exploiting this extreme local linkage disequilibrium along the genome. And somehow that's translating into uh, lower rank approximate matrices.
Now, how do you extend this? How do you extend it, for example, to sequencing? Well, you have the same nuclear norm penalty, the lambda times the norm of z. You have the same sum of squares, but now you may want to use a weighted sum of squares because the weights reflect how deep your sequencing is at any given SNP. And what you observe is now not necessarily a 0, 1, or 2. It's probably most practical thing is a posterior mean based on a simple binomial model. OK, so you can easily extend this to matrix completion to dosage completion using uh, the techniques I've already described. And you can find the minimum and you can accelerate the process by the same steps that you use for standard imputation. Okay. Now, we got interested in, can there, are, are there other things we can do to improve the quality of the genotyping imputation? One of the things is sometimes the data comes in families. And matrix completion, any of the other genotype imputation methods rely solely on linkage disequilibrium. They don't bring into, in fact, play the family structure. And the family structure can actually be quite informative. So you can screen matrix completion for Mendelian inconsistencies. And I'll have to show you what that means in a moment. Uh, and we looked at two ways, one of doing this post-processing or simultaneous processing. One would be to add a penalty to the matrix completion objective function that enforces similarity between close relatives. And the closer they are, the more similar they should be. Or what we found was more workable was a projection step after the after genotype imputation was done, that projects to Mendelian consistency. Okay, now what is projection? In this context, it means you look at a, each nuclear family at a time, and for each member of the nuclear family, you list all the Mendelian. Well, for the family collectively, you list all Mendelian consistent genotype vectors, and you select the combination. So for each, for the parents and the children, you're going to select a 0, 1, or 2. You select the Mendelian consistent combination that gives the smallest Euclidean distance to, the act, to your original imputed genotypes. This step is extremely fast. Here, here's what's going on. So if you imagine just a, a, a trio, mother, father, ch child. The blue circles are lattice points, so their coordinates are 0, 1, or 2. And the blue lattice points are the uh, Mendelian consistent genotypes, where the parents are consistent in a Mendelian sense with the child. Now here we have, after processing, uh, we get a dosage, so the genotype completion, the matrix completion problem gives us a number, doesn't give us a 0, 1, or 2. It gives us a number typically between 0 and 2. And if we project to the closest lattice point, and the closest lattice point, the coordinates all have to be integers, 0, 1, or 2, could be this green one, which is not Mendelian, and we can correct that mistake by projecting down to the Mendelian, closest Mendelian consistent genotype combination. OK. There was another problem. We wanted to follow this up uh, by actually generating haplotypes for individuals. I wanted to do this in the simplest possible way. I don't know if this is known or not. I can't find this in the literature, but it turns out to be very simple-minded and very effective. But you have to think about it a little bit to make sure the algorithmic complexity doesn't uh, uh, explode on you. So how do you phrase the problem? 
So most studies nowadays, you have a, a reference list of gene, uh, uh, haplotypes. Again, we're thinking about just imputing haplotypes in a small window, maybe of 300 SNPs, something like that. Okay, so we have a list of haplotypes. We can incorporate those in some matrix H. And we want to choose the two haplotypes that give us the best fit to now our imputed genotype across that window. This, oddly enough, reverses the process of what many of the competing software programs do. They first do haplotyping, and then they impute genotypes, which is kind of backwards. I think it makes more sense to impute the genotypes and then impute the haplotype. Okay, so if we think of it as a fitting problem, we have a minimization over H1 and H2 of what we could parameterize in various ways, uh, but using Euclidean norms is the simplest. Okay, so here's where the computational, you have to think about like an optimizing compiler on a computer. How can we do this stuff in the least number of steps because even if you've got a modern computer which is ultra fast, these problems can take a long time unless you analyze how to do them as quickly as possible. So here is the criteria. I've stuck a half in just for convenience. And you can expand out your fitting criteria according to the standard rules for dealing with inner products and Euclidean norms. You want to find H1 and H2 to do this to give you the smallest distance here. And the solution is to re reduce the amount of computing as much as possible so that you pre-compute and store for your reference sequence these scalar combinations. You just put them in a matrix. And you, that's then stored in your computer. And now for each person you encounter, there are different x. And you have to compute these terms and choose H1 and H2 so this overall criterion on the right is minimized. And so you compute all of these inner products in one operation. It's a matrix mul vector multiplication, very fast on a computer. You can use parallel processing to do this. And once you've got the, all those inner products, then the problem reduces to simply looking up in a matrix of scalars to find the best combination of indices, haplotypes, that minimize the overall criterion. And this is a very simple-minded add-on, but it is much faster than any alternative we've come across. So here's some, some of the imputation software currently out there. I tell people if I had a computer program, I would not name it Beagle because it sounds like a dog. <laughs> but be that as may. Uh, they all have various strengths and weaknesses. Uh, some require reference panels. Actually, matrix completion works fine in the absence of a reference panel, but it does better if you have a reference panel. Some of them require full phase data. Some of them allow you to have pedigree data. Some of them don't. Some of them allow you to have fractional dosages. Some of you don't. Some of them impose restrictions on what kind of missing data patterns you can have. And most of these programs operate through what are called hidden Markov chains, which is a big paradigm in bioinformatics. But I think that they've been a little bit too seductive. They, uh, some of these alternative data mining techniques can give you answers more quickly than hidden Markov chains. And that's one of the reasons that we wanted to explore this. So here's uh, some comparisons under random missingness. This was a small data set, 112 individuals, nuclear family quartets, two children, just 790 SNPs, and masking 10% of the en entries. So matrix completion actually is uh, competitive. It's not the best on quality. It's not the best on time, but it's close to the best on time. 
F impute is by far the fastest, and it's by far the most inaccurate. So I don't know how to choose these things. Uh, so there are about 88,000 entries in these tables. Here's the same numbers with systematic missingness where you might have two different platforms. And matrix completion does very well in that uh, regard. Beagle, Beagle uh, for some reason, does less well. So I think we're within range of, and I think we haven't squeezed all the computational efficiency out of this matrix completion idea yet. So we're certainly very competitive at this point. Okay. Now, since we were talking about matrix completion, I thought I'd show you another idea where the same notion comes into play. It's, it works in genetics, but it also works in other problems. And that's in discriminant analysis. In discriminant analysis, you have a certain number of features you collect on individuals or animals, whatever you're trying to classify. You have a certain number of the cases that are classified into a finite number of categories, and then you have a certain number of unclassified cases. And this is one of the most studied problems in statistics and big data, and it's actually very hard to do better than any of the existing methods, and there are a slew of them. But I think this is kind of interesting uh, case where matrix completion seemed to give some advantages in a certain setting. So how do we use matrix completion in this sense? Well, we have to think about geometrically encoding the different classes. And so we are going to put the different classes as the vertices of, if we, we have three classes, that are each class corresponds to the vertex of an equilateral triangle symmetrically around the origin in the plane. If we have four classes, the vertices correspond to a tetrahedron, equal angle tetrahedron. OK. And we want them to be, all these classes to be equal distant because we want to preserve as much symmetry as possible. So how, do, how does this play into matrix completion? We take our data on the features you know, a bunch of features, a bunch of individuals, and we add extra columns to that matrix. We'll call it X. And these matrix, the extra columns hold the vertices of these geometric encodings of the uh, various classes. Now, for the unassigned individuals, we don't have a class, so we have some of those geometric encodings missing. Okay, so how do we classify? Well, the beauty of this is we want to be able to classify in the presence of a lot of missing data, and this is where this method actually works quite well. It doesn't work better than existing uh, discriminant methods in the absence of missing data, but some data sets have lots of missing data, and we attack it by matrix completion. And at the end, <laughs> of matrix completion, you look at the geometric encodings for the unclassified observations, and you take the vertex which is closest, and that becomes their classification. And you almost always get the right classification by that vertex or the next one down in closeness. So here's the geometric encoding of three classes. Here's how you expand the matrix, cases, predictors, vertex entries, classified, unclassified. A lot of this is missing. You fill it in. And this is slides too busy. Let me just say this is uh, cancer data sets, different forms of uh, cancer. These are uh, expression levels and matrix completion. We're uh, following here the uh, 
the air rates. And these air rates are fairly high because we've got high percentage of missing data. But matrix completion discriminant analysis in this setting where there's lots of missing data seems to be better than any of the competing methods. If you didn't have missing data, it would be competitive, but it wouldn't shine. But because you're in the paradigm where it works, it works quite well. OK, so let me summarize this part of the talk. Uh, well, this matrix completion. So it's simultaneously imputing the missing predictors and the and classes. The alternative is to first impute the missing predictors and then classify the unclassified cases based on the completed data. This does it simultaneously and probably does it better for that reason. Its advantage increases as the fraction of missing data increases. Now, to make this work, you need to normalize the predictors, mean zero, variance one. Uh, the theory says that data should be missing at random. It doesn't actually have to be missing at random in practice for this to work, but we don't really understand the theory outside the original mathematical formulation. So if you want an interesting theoretical problem, help us justify what it appears to be a, a quite a nice way of doing uh, discriminant analysis. OK. Now this is some of the hardest material in the talk. It's maybe already been over some of your heads, and I apologize. But I want to bring you up to speed on a class of algorithms which I think will have a profound impact on big data analysis and ultimately genomics. The second most cited paper in statistics is the Dempster, Laird, and Rubin paper on the EM algorithm. It's got nearly 45,000 citations. So this is important. Here's an algorithm, class of algorithms that generalize EM algorithm. Every EM algorithm is an M algor MM algorithm. And the idea is fantastically simple in theory. In practice, to devise these algorithms takes a certain amount of talent with dealing with inequalities. Here's the idea. You have some objective function. Let's say you want to minimize it. OK. That's f of theta. You place above f of theta a surrogate for that function, which we'll call g of theta. And it's anchored at the current point. OK. So it's anchored right here. And it majorizes the given function in the sense that it always lies above the given function. OK. So what you do is you, instead of minimizing f, which may be hard, in this case it's non-differentiable. It has these kinks in it. The surrogate is quadratic. It's easy to minimize. So you minimize the surrogate instead. And when you minimize the surrogate, what happens is you drive the objective downhill. And this sequence of inequalities and equalities follows directly from the two requirements for a majorizing function. g lies above f. Theta n plus 1 is chosen to minimize g. And then we have tangency at the current point theta n. And this is what makes this whole class of algorithms work. OK, so why does one do this? Well, it has a number of advantages. The EM algorithms are based on missing data paradigms. And these can be, you have to be clever to think of what the missing data is. It's not always just the obvious, oh, some observations are not there. It can be much more subtle than that. And then to make them work, you have to calculate these sometimes complicated conditional expectations. You don't have to deal with missing data at all. OK? Now that means you, have, you make up for it by figuring out how to do these majorizations. And that brings in talent with inequalities. But the MM principle can separate the parameters of a problem. And parameter separation means you can farm out subproblems to different processors and pick up a lot in computational speed. Typically, when you do that, you avoid these large matrix inversions as you would see in something like Newton's method. 
you can linearize a problem, typical uh, majorizing function or surrogate is a quadratic. Built into the uh, MM updates are the constraints, so you can deal gracefully with equality and inequality constraints. You can turn non-differentiable problems into smooth problems. You can take out the kinks. The only problem is sometimes these algorithms can be very slow to converge. So they may take a thousand or more iterations to converge. That may be okay because speed of convergence in a computer algorithm depends on two things. The number of, the number of iterations until convergence and the price per iteration. So if the price per iteration is very small, you can stand, you can trade off and still gain even if you have to take a large number of iterations to convergence. There's a whole list of uh, ways of doing this. Here's a math book. If you are a math nerd, this is the place to go, first place to go to learn how to deal with these various classes of inequality. Some of them, uh, like Geom arithmetic geometric mean, you may have even seen in high school. Uh, the Cauchy Schwartz inequality, most basic inequality in mathematics. There's an information inequality, which is actually what's behind all these EM algorithms. There's Jensen's inequality for convex functions. So if you put a chord above a, connecting two points on a convex function, the chord lies above the graph. And then there's these supporting hyperplane functions. If you have a convex function, you can put a line under it touching a single point. So you, many of these things have kind of geometric intuition behind them. I'll show you an example of this quadratic upper bound principle. It's very simple minded, but it gives you the idea. So suppose you wanted to solve the problem of minimizing cosine of x. It's a stupid problem because you know what the minimum are and the maximum, they occur at uh, multiples of pi, this is either minus one or plus one. But if you wanted to design an algorithm to do this, you could use Newton's method. But if you want an MM algorithm, you take a second order Taylor expansion, that's this first equation, and this point Z over here is chosen to lie between X, the next, next potential iterate and your current iterate Xn. And because the cosine is always bounded above by one in absolute value, this function g actually lies above the cosine. I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. This is a quadratic in x, not xn. These are constants. So this is a quadratic in x, and it has a very simple solution. You just differentiate, set the derivative equal to zero. You're looking for the a stationary point of the curve, and that's your algorithm. This is an example of the quadratic upper bound principle. Here's what the majorization looks like. You're majorizing by a quadratic function. Here's green at this point here. That's xn. You go to the bottom. You come down here. You re-majorize. You can see you keep descending into this trough, and ultimately you reach the minimum of the function. And here's a comparison of Newton's method to MM, and this is very odd. Newton's method is the gold standard for, for speed. In this case, MM actually beats Newton's method. That is an absolute uh, lie in general. <laughs> uh, Newton's method is often much faster just on pure operations counts. Okay, in these large-scale uh, GWAS studies, how am I doing for time, by the way? Am I going way over here? You're good. You're good. Ten, ten minutes. Ten minutes? Okay. So, in these large-scale G, uh, GWAS studies, people use these linear mixed models. They're models based on a normal distribution, you have a uh, set of, you have a predictor matrix X that encodes the SNPs and the other predictors. 
you have a regression coefficients. Those are the betas. And then you have these variance components, the sigma i squared, which are the variance components, like one would be the environmental variance and the other would be uh, additive genetic variance. And you want to adjust for polygenic inheritance. So how do you do it? You simultaneously estimate the mean effects, the betas, and the variance components. The simplest case is you, one of these matrices, V1, is a kinship matrix, and the other one is uh, just random environment, an identity matrix. And this is used when you have related or hidden relatedness in your sample. Okay. This is a classical problem. All I'll show you is that there is, in fact, an MM update that... Uh, my colleague Wa Zhao and I discovered last year. This, in fact, was kind of the first substantial progress or new method of estimation for this class of problems in probably 25 or 30 years. And it turned out to be very simple. Involves just quadratic forms, and traces. Works better than current EM algorithm, but it's not necessarily better than... Uh, Fisher scoring, depending on the size of the pedigrees. Okay. Another example, I know I'm, this is like drinking from a fire hydrant, but if you ignore the relatedness, standard GWAS just reduces to least squares. And GWAS, the way it's currently done, is you regress, you do a bunch of Simple linear regressions, one SNP at a time. Now, in standard statistics, you don't do that. You do multivariate regression. Why don't you do multivariate regression on a GWAS? Problem's too big. It's too big, and it's underdetermined. You have too many predictors and not enough observations. Okay, so the, the usual solution least square solution is not operative. Uh, but if you start to think in terms of sparsity, you can solve this problem. Now, what does sparsity mean? You want just a few SNPs to enter the final model. Okay, so you need to impose some kind of sparsity. You can do this by penalty methods. So you add to the least squares criteria at the upper right, a penalty term. And that's, those penalties come in, like the, there's a so-called lasso penalty that often comes into play. But you can also define sparsity directly by limiting the number of coordinates, the number of components of beta, which are non-zero. Those correspond to the selected SNPs in the model. If you want just two, if you just want, uh, one SNP in the model, a simple-minded case, and you had two SNPs, what would this sparsity set look like? It would look like the vertical axis union with the horizontal axis. Okay? So it's a kind of a funny-looking set. But you can actually project onto these sets. Now, I'll, I'll just mention briefly the modern way of doing these problems. I'm going to talk about something called iterative hard thresholding, which is a big data technique that's come in in the last five years, which seems to work very well for these sparse large-scale regression problems. It's based on the gradient. We have an objective function. It's the sum of squares. Gradient is just what? It's the derivatives, partial derivatives of the function as a vector. And these gradient methods they don't incorporate curvature information. They only incorporate gradient information. But there is a direction of steepest descent, and that's along the gradient direction. So these large-scale optimization problems in modern data mining, many of them are attacked through steepest descent. The tricky thing is often choosing the step size. 
Okay, if you can do, and I, I won't spell out the details here, but you can do a majorization of your least squares criterion. Uh, this constant L is not always known, but if you choose it right, then you're, you get gradient descent. This is a gradient descent algorithm based in terms of the gradient, the steepest minus the gradient points in the steepest direction down the mountainside. And you're bound to drive the uh, objective function downhill. Here's, this is kind of typical what uh, gradient ascent looks like. Think of this as a mountaineer. This is gradient ascent. You're going up the mountain. These are the contour lines. The gradient points is perpendicular to the contour lines. You follow the gradient for a certain ways. You, you truncate, and then the next step, you've, you go perpendicular to the, another contour line, and you keep zigzagging into the optimal point. Now, these iterative hard thresholding algorithms, they do one more thing. They say, well, we have a constraint set, so our solution has to be on the constraint set. The constraint set in GWAS is only a certain number of the components, only a certain number of SNPs can be brought into the model. So they project the gradient step back to the constraint step. They find the closest point in the constraint step to their uh, gradient step. So GBOS by iterative hard thresholding, then this actually has been working very well. Here we have a two-dimensional problem. So we have two predictors. The constraint set is the union of this vertical axis and this horizontal axis. We want just one predictor in the model. So we go along the gradient direction up to our new point. That's gradient descent. And then we project it back to the constraint set. And that's, in a nutshell, what iterative hard thresholding does. And um, I, I think I'll skip over. We did a simulation study. The competition for this is something called lasso penalized regression, which is a big deal in big data now. There's another penalty method besides the lasso called MCP. And what we're finding is iterative hard thresholding is not as fast as the lasso, but it has a much lower uh, false positive rate. And it is faster, uh, slightly faster than MCP, and it has uh, a much smaller false negative rate. So it's combining the best features of these current two top contenders, which uh, are based on penalized regression. And I think it uh, will actually be very useful in, in future studies. OK, I think I'm going to have to end here. I was going to talk a little bit about iterative uh, of sparse principal components, but I don't have time. So big data models and algorithms, in my opinion, are still underexploited in genetics. And the flow of ideas is two ways, but it's starting to we're not seeing enough push of ideas from big data into genetics. I want to accelerate that. The frequentist methods of computational statistics are overwhelming. They don't give as nuanced an understanding as the Bayesian methods, but they're much faster. So high dimensional optimization. I've exposed you very quickly to some of the dominant themes, block descent or block ascent, this MM algorithm, very crucial. Gradient descent, Euclidean projections, parameter splitting, which I haven't talked about, and acceleration, which I barely talked about. These methods tend to work best in combination. So it's not, you don't have to choose. You can mix and match. And a lot of the traditional theory in big data revolves around the notion of convexity. If you don't, you're not a mathematician, you may not know what that means. But we're being forced into dealing with non-convex sets like that union of the horizontal and vertical axis is a non-convex set. If I take two points on that set 
and draw the line between those points, that line is not necessarily on this convex set. So we're being pushed into these non-convex situations, but the tools there, uh, the guarantees aren't as good, but the tools work. And finally, penalization by itself, and we've seen this with the lasso, it does create sparsity, but it also creates shrinkage, and I, this would be another story telling about this. And that shrinkage causes the parameter estimates to be too low. That's not so bad. You can go back and redo the an analysis with your selected model. But in the process of the shrinking, it brings in extra parameters, extra SNPs that shouldn't be in the model. So iterative hard thresholding seems to be one of the ways to go in the future. So I think I'll stop there, and I've talked enough. And what I like uh, best about this kind of talk is it's a, it's a great reminder to all of us how uh, you know, we really stand on the shoulders of, of guys like Ken who are working in the trenches to design you know, all of the computational infrastructure we use on a daily basis and we just kind of take it for granted whether it's imputation or the admixture calculations or doing these kinds of optimizations that there's real, uh, real breadth and depth you know, to what happens to enable us to be able to use those kinds of tools. And it's uh, guys like Ken who, who uh, you know, get, get it done. So I think it's, uh, again, we kind of get more and more removed for that, from that as the tools are more efficient and we just pull these packages in and, and we use them to carry out our work. Uh, but knowing that there's this depth of thinking going on, I think uh, we should all uh, you know, appreciate that. So uh, we have uh, time. I think we're supposed to sit at the table and have it be more informal. Is that right, John? Yeah, you can do that. And uh, so any questions uh, yes. for Ken? Major is it? Because it, it forces in, in the algorithm that you ultimately design by minimizing the circuit to drive the objective function downhill. You don't have that guarantee otherwise. If you're maximizing a function, you, you put the surrogate underneath. It's tangent at a given point that falls below. And when you maximize the surrogate, it drives the log likelihood uphill. So it if you want a stable algorithm, you're, you need to go in the right direction. You need to be pushing downhill. If you want to decrease something, minimize something, you want to push uphill if you're maximizing something. But if you did like an underestimation, oh, thank you. If, if you did an underestimation and then maybe did like a branching and bounding of the solution space um, to, to make sure that you don't miss the global optimum solution. Well, I'm not sure I can answer your question. Let, let me make another point, though, and that is these uh, majorizations and minorizations have to be done with a fair amount of thought because you want the surrogate function to hug as tightly as possible with the objective function. The tighter it hugs what you're actually trying to drive uphill or downhill, the better job it will do, the faster you will get to the bottom or the top. Uh, None of these optimization methods, once you depart from the notion of convexity, convex functions or convex constraints, are actually guaranteed to find the optimal solution. So you may have to run them from multiple starting points or start from kind of inferior techniques like methods of moments estimators that get you in the right neighborhood so that then you're sucked into the optimal, global optimum. Yes. If you just wait for the mic. Sorry. What does this look like concretely? So, you know, how big of a problem are you attacking with this, and how long did the computation take? And you, you said big data a lot. Is, does that mean that this is also, in some ways, um, uh, distributed? The implementations. Well, um, our our, our uh, goal is to be able to do GWAS and genotype imputation on a desktop computer. You shouldn't have to do this on a big cluster. 
if you have a big cluster, you haven't thought about the problem long enough to devise the best algorithms. So our hope is you can do hundreds of thousands of SNPs and tens of thousands of people on a desktop computer. Does that answer your question? For the somewhat linear regression, oh, sorry. Um, so, so we have to say, you know, like say, you want to select the best three variables to do the prediction. So we first learn to use AIC, BIC, and then later Rasso to avoid this overtraining problem. So I'm not sure if, like, for your iterate uh, so strategy problem, is like overtraining issues there? Well, okay. So in practice, you pick the uh, best model size by cross validation. That's a standard thing to do in computational statistics. Cross-validation means you do a lot more computation because you're, you're throwing out maybe 10% of the data, you train on another 90%, then you predict for the 10%, you see how you do, and then you average those predictions across all the possible 10% of the data. So cross-validation is the way you do model size selection. But cross-validation means you have to do a lot more computation than you would if you knew the appropriate model size in advance. So, but cross-validation is standard. It's just it's painful because of the amount of computation. And that puts even more pressure on getting good algorithms to do this as quickly and accurately as possible. If you do, use something like the lasso, they have a... Uh, parameter which multiplies, the, the, gives you the size of the penalty. You cannot specify a certain number of predictors in the model. You have to follow that system of solutions as the penalty constant increases until you hit the right samples, until you hit the right model size. So that uh, these uh, iterative hard thresholding things which operate on fixed model size actually have some advantages in that sense, when you come to cross-validation. Thank you. All right, well, John runs over there for Boris. Uh, just kind of maybe a comment on, you know, so one of the things in your career you've done uh, really well is, is coding of these complex algorithms in an efficient way, and maybe a few words of, you know, what are you using these days to sort of code up this sort of complex thing to achieve the kind of speed gains? Okay, so er Eric and I were talking over lunch. Uh, I've been working for the last year in a language called Julio, which is coming out of MIT. And it's turned out to be a perfect environment. I want to bring something else up here while I'm thinking about it. Uh, we're doing these numerical issues problems because it, it's a, a just-in-time compiled language. It's free. It's got the goodies of MATLAB and not a, a library system, not as big as R, but still has lots of libraries for statistics and high-dimensional optimization. And it's been a wonderful environment to do prototyping and then move the code quickly into production code. It, in the past, when people did algorithm development, they would prototype on small problems, write something quickly in MATLAB or R, and then find when they went to the big problems, it was taking far too long. Here, you can avoid, you can do all that in a single language setting, and that has been very much to our advantage. As I said, it has parallel processing capabilities. It has even support for graphic processing units. I think it's a wonderful environment. So let me make a pitch. I'm holding a uh, workshop on Open Mendel. Mendel is my software for genetic analysis. We're rewriting it entirely in Julia. We're going to make it open source. And we're going to have a workshop in August in, at Stanford. And if you would like to come, uh, let, it, let us know. You can write me, and I can tie you into the people that will uh, we may have to select, I don't know how many participants, we can only accommodate maybe 30 or 40 at most. But I'd like to have some representation from this group. I think it would be great. 
Um, the other thing I'll put in a plug, if I got your appetite at all whetted for this uh, notion of MM algorithms, which are going to be the next focus, in my opinion, of algorithm development, because they generalize these EM algorithms. I have a book coming out from SIAM this year just on the topic of MM algorithms, so keep that in mind. Great, thanks. Thanks. Uh, Boris? Yeah, thanks for interesting talk. Uh, can you comment a little bit on <clears throat> protein folding problem or drug design on other applications? Not intelligently. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, there's probably ample opportunity to bring in these big data techniques, and I suspect they're underused. The field is in developing incredibly rapidly. There's so many bright minds in computer science and statistics, applied mathematics, devising these new algorithms that, for handling high-dimensional problems. And by and large, there's a gap between inception and translating them into specific application fields. So all, all I can say is generally there's maybe something out there for your kind of problem. You just have to educate yourself enough about what's out there in the big data algorithm arena and see if you can transfer it. Uh, Ali? So I had a general question regarding some of the Happel type approaches you, uh, you mentioned. Is there, is there kind of a natural way to combine these kind of uh, uh, phase by transmission or trio based approaches to kind of read back phasing approaches? Do you think there's the model that you presented a little bit, uh, you can, that there's a way to link it to many of these different things like WhatsApp and HapCut hash that have been used in the read back uh, analyses? What does read back analysis mean? Sorry, so if you have a, a single read in which uh, okay. distal SNPs are linked together, mm -hmm. you can start to infer Happel types uh, from reads themselves. So without having to have kind of uh, pedigree information or family information, you would say, for example, if you had a single read that spanned a whole chromosome and you knew that that originated from a single Happel type, then you would have that whole chromosome as one phase. Oh, well, that's... So, so Ali specializes in the, you know, de novo assembly of genomes using these long read technologies oh, okay. where you're... Uh, of course, if those are fully reliable, it almost solves your problem. <laughs> but they don't. <laughs> so, so, so the data is traditionally very messy in these contexts or is very incomplete, right? So the, obviously, if you have trio information, you can phase whole chromosomes. So I'm well, just curious the, to know. Yeah, the... the uh, Mendel projection of Mendelian consistency is a post-processing step that you could attach to any of these genotype imputation technologies and it would improve your uh, genotyping, uh, your imputation process. Uh, yeah. So worth, and maybe at some point think about it, whether there's any way to formally <laughs> kind of integrate. Because I've together. just been seeing, like, I think in the last year, there's, there's just been the first papers that have started to try to integrate the two ideas. And uh, so I was just curious to see if you'd kind of thought about it. I haven't looked about into it. that. I, it's certainly worthy, though. And I encourage you to do so. Maybe, I hope I've given you some leads about where to go. Pay? He just to warn uh, you, studied under Tib Shirani and uh, did a lot of these shrinkage regression methods that you talked about. So. Oh. Yeah, I really enjoyed the talk. Thanks. Uh, I have a question regarding the matrix completion part. Yes. Yes. You mentioned that um, the assumption underlying those are missing at random. Uh, but often we are dealing with data where we have some. Um, it's not missing at random, and we have some understanding about the underlying missing mechanism, like if we can specify a probability model for the missing event. Is there any possibility to integrate those uh, missing mechanism together with this matrix completion uh, framework? I don't see why not. It's not something I've thought about, and unfortunately, the the practice is outdistancing the theory at this point. We can show that matrix completion works very well even in the presence of non-random missingness. 
but I, I haven't seen any papers justifying it. But there's a topic for you. Yeah, so I, I guess I want to get a little bit more insight on uh, this matrix completion framework. Can that be linked to some of their likelihoods, understanding of the data, or um, it's... It's a, it's a very non-likelihood-based <laughs> machine. Uh, I don't know. Okay. It, it certainly links up with penalization well, right, but right, likelihoods right. I haven't seen anything like that. Okay, okay thanks. Yeah, the, the closest would be uh, on, on the sequencing data. You, can, you do have some underlying model for the dosage levels, but that's, that's then fed into the black box. All I tried to do today was part the curtains a little bit so you could look inside the black box. All right, great. Well, if uh, no more questions, let's thank Ken uh, once again for a great, uh, great talk.